Welcome. The people you see behind me are professional actors. They are about to portray hospitalized patients, doctors, and nurses in some of the most common situations related to the topic of agitation. As many of you know, these situations in which older persons are either becoming agitated or are already agitated can be frustrating, time consuming, and even dangerous to them and those who care for them. You are also about to see possible solutions. There are three guiding principles when trying to manage these situations. Anticipate, tolerate, and don't agitate. Anticipate. Certain behaviors and actions are common, not normal, but common, especially among hospitalized patients with delirium. Being able to anticipate these behaviors and actions may avoid an episode of agitation. Tolerate. This one's tough. But if we can tolerate behaviors and actions that aren't normal, this will not only allow us to remain calm, it may help our patients remain calm as well. When we tolerate behaviors also, it allows us to observe some of these behaviors for a little bit so we can find clues as to what's causing the agitation. Don't agitate. Perhaps the most difficult of the three principles in healthcare, we've learned standards and norms that may not always apply to the older person who is confused. For example, reorientation may not always help. It may be better to try and understand what the patient is perceiving in their world at that time. Remember, perception is their reality. Finally, when trying to implement any of these three principles for a given situation, Keep in mind one thing, finding solutions often involves creativity, trial and error, and a lot of patience. Let's take a look at agitation in the hospital setting. Mr. Robinson is 85 years old and he has a moderate to severe dementia. He's been in the hospital three days for pneumonia. Something is different today. Keep in mind when agitation occurs in the hospital, it's commonly due to delirium. Delirium is defined as an acute change in mental status. It can be characterized as a hypoactive or lethargic state. Or, as is the case here, it can be characterized as a hyperactive or agitated state. Since delirium is due to a medical illness until proven otherwise, it's imperative for medical professionals to recognize and manage the agitation associated with delirium. If a patient is labeled agitated and demented, then the medical illness that may be causing the delirium and thus the agitation may not be found. Morning, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson, good morning. Six o'clock, trying to get up. Ugh. It's like a nice day outside. Ugh. Do you want to sit up? Uh, it's me, Alice, Mr. Uh, Robinson. I'm your nurse aide. Do you need uh, to go to the bathroom? Uh, Do you want to go uh, to the bathroom? Uh, are, you, are you in pain? You need to tell me where the pain is. You need to tell me what's what's wrong, uh, Mr. Robinson. Where where's your pain? Uh, Do you want me to get medication? Uh, Let's analyze this situation. Remember, Mr. Robinson has a moderate to severe dementia. He can't possibly answer all those questions, even on a good day. You can see how frustrated Alice is, but her inability to recognize that this agitation is associated with delirium just makes her nervous and anxious. She just keeps asking questions. Now her solution to go get medication is not a bad one for a patient with pain. However, that solution may prevent her and the doctors to find the cause of his delirium. Good morning, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson, good morning. It's time to wake up. Oh. Six o'clock. Uh. Looks like oh. a nice day outside. Oh. Do you want to sit up? Oh. oh. Are you in pain, Mr. Robinson? It looks like you're in pain. Okay, I'm gonna go get some help. Did you notice how calm she was? That after her first question, she realized something was wrong? How she just observed Mr. Robinson? 
What was Alice thinking? Mr. Robinson is not the same. Something's different. He's obviously in pain, but there's something else going on. Alice has recognized that this is agitation in the face of delirium, and now she's going to get help. Now it's the doctor's turn. Mr. Robinson is still in pain and still agitated. As you'll see, recognizing agitation in the face of delirium is also quite difficult for doctors. All right, Mr. Robinson, the nurse tells me that you've been hurting. Where's your pain and how long have you been having it? Mr. Robinson, where are you hurting? Can you help me with this? Mr. Robinson, it's okay. Settle down. Mr. Robinson, it's okay. Settle down. Calm down, Mr. Robinson. I don't know. I'll order some lab tests and some x-rays. Okay. Call me if you need anything. But doctor, what about his pain medication? Oh, we can't do anything until we get the results. But, doctor, it's okay. It's not easy to examine a patient who's agitated. Staying calm and tolerating behaviors can help. Let's watch the same scenario where the doctor's no less happy to be there than before. But this time, she recognizes this is agitation in the face of delirium. She then changes her approach and uses the principles, tolerate, don't agitate. All right, Mr. Robinson, the nurse says you've been hurting. Where's your pain and how long have you been having it? Mr. Robinson, where are you hurting? Let's just step back a minute and watch him and see if we can't get some clues where the pain's coming from. The key principle here is to tolerate. Although we don't want to tolerate pain, we want to tolerate the patient's behavior so that we can observe and get clues to what might be causing the pain. A full assessment is important to a patient's workup and treatment, but it may not be possible at this time. What we don't want to do is give him a diagnosis of agitation. The other key principle is don't agitate. Watch closely how the doctor with the nurse carefully and calmly examine the patient without agitating him in order to get a little more information. He's really tender. Why don't you come around here? Don't touch him, though. Just... Okay. If he'll let us, let's gently lift him up. Okay. We're going to lift you up, Mr. Robinson. Here we go. You okay? It's okay. There we go. Okay, I'm just going to press on your back a little bit. Just another second or so. Okay, put him back down. Well, I'm not really sure. It could be his abdomen, could be his kidneys. I'll order some x-rays and some lab tests. Call me if you need anything, okay? Uh, doctor, what about his pain medication? Are his vitals stable? Yes, doctor. Um, then let's go ahead and give him two milligrams of morphine. Okay, we will do. Mr. Robinson, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to get you some pain medication, okay? Staying calm, observing the patient, and using non-agitation techniques seemed to really help this time. In that first exam, it seemed everywhere that the doctor touched the patient, he was hurting. However, in the second exam, you can see a different approach by the doctor, which helped her figure out 
where he might be hurting. Again, making a diagnosis in an agitated delirious patient can be very challenging, but through the principles of calm toleration and non-agitation, you'll have a much better exam in order to make the right diagnosis. Remember the principle, don't agitate? Well, the hospital is full of things that seem necessary, however, they can agitate an older person. Some of the most common, as you know, are IVs, physical restraints, but one that tops the charts is Foley catheters. Good afternoon, Mr. Elliott. How are you doing today? Don't like this. Oh, now, now, if you don't have that in there, it won't do you any good. <laughs> no good, I don't like this. Please, Mr. Elliott. Just lie still, it'll feel better in a few moments. <laughs> the doctor says you need to keep this in there. <laughs> Mr. Elliot, if you don't stop pulling it, I'm gonna have to tie your hands. <laughs> wow, that's a tough situation. But what can a nurse do? Tolerate this behavior? Anticipate it? While those principles are important in a situation like this, the key principle in this vignette is don't agitate. While you may not be the cause of the initial agitation, your role is still don't make the agitation worse. What did the nurse do that made the agitation worse? One thing to keep in mind, if Mr. Elliott is from a nursing home, there's a good chance he didn't come in with this Foley catheter. Let's keep that in mind as we watch what happens. Well, hello, Mr. Elliot. Oh. Don't like that. T -t -t take it out. Okay, let me take out. a look at this. Sure. I'm just gonna take a look at this. These can be uncomfortable sometimes, I know. Okay. Ah, I see the problem. You in a lot of discomfort? Okay, let me get some help. Okay, so it's, we're going to make this okay. Hi, Joel. Joel, this is Mr. Elliot. How you doing, Mr. Elliot? He's going to spend a few moments with you. I'll be right back. I'm going to go talk to the doctor. How you doing, Mr. Elliot? <laughs> yeah. Tell me about what you do, Mr. Elliot. Cars, mechanic. Mechanic. Well, I need you. <laughs> yeah, my air just went out. Crazy. Air conditioning. Cars. Oh, good. Cars. Good, good. Cars. Uh -huh. he, he, he didn't. He didn't cost. <laughs> it's okay. Mr. Elliot, we've got some good news. I talked to the doctor. It took some doing, but she wants you to be comfortable, and she said we can go ahead and take this out for you. Good, good. It'll only take a few moments. We can do this right now. So what did you notice? Did you see the nurse's hand approach from below? Did you see her distraction techniques? Did you see how well Joel just jumped into the scenario? Did you see how Joel subtly took his hand and shook Mr. Elliot's hand? Did you notice Joel's simple language? Did not ask him complex questions, but just held on a very simple conversation. Finally, what did the nurse say to convince the doctor to get that Foley catheter out? We don't know. But we do know it was most important to her to get the thing out that was agitating the patient. We've covered the principles of toleration and non-agitation. What about anticipation? Do you remember Mr. Robinson? He got his two milligrams of morphine, which helped the pain and in turn helped the agitation, and he calmed down nicely. Here, the nurse returns about two hours later to check on him. Oh. Hey, Mr. Robinson. Looks like you're in some pain again. Oh. Tell you what, let me go get you some more pain medication, okay? Oh. Looks like you pulled your IV out, didn't you? Well, that's all right. I'll get you fixed up. Tell you what, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. We'll take care of this for you. Well, that was a relatively calm reaction by the nurse. Perhaps it was the first time this patient had pulled his IV out. And not to pick on this nurse, 
But how many of us have felt or thought about reacting in the way you're about to see? Uh, hey, Mr. Robinson, looks like you're experiencing some pain again. Tell you what, I'll go get you some more pain medication, okay? <sighs> Look what you did. Uh, Pulled your IV out. Why did you do that? You know that stops the flow of the medication, don't you? I'll be right back. Wow, these situations can be very tough. But what can we do? You're about to see one technique and how to handle a particular situation. But keep in mind, it's only one technique. The guiding principle here is anticipation. And what can we anticipate? You know what to anticipate. You know what these patients do to things that irritate them, that agitate them. They pull them out, they try to get rid of them. But if you can expect it, then you can plan for it. Mr. Robinson's resting comfortably now, and I gave him a, about two milligrams of morphine earlier, but the only thing is we're a little bit, um, we're anticipating, I should say, that he's going to possibly pull out his IV when he wakes up. So there's a couple of tricks of the trade uh, that I can show you that'll help that out a little bit. First one is we're gonna wrap the IV, or we're gonna hide it, essentially. Get that out of there. Uh, the second thing we will do is we will also tape what they call a decoy to that arm over there. Um, that way, hopefully, when he wakes up, he will uh, go for that instead of this. And if he pulls that one out, it also won't hurt him, which is uh, obviously important. <laughs> Last thing we'll do as well is we'll go ahead and uh, we'll hide this after, um, after I get finished wrapping his arm. That way when he wakes up, he won't see it and it'll cut down on the agitation. Okay. Sometimes when patients see their IV lines, it causes more agitation than what's necessary. So, so sort of out of sight, out of mind. There you go, exactly. Okay. Yeah, you got it. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this about up to his sleeve. And then once that's done, we'll go ahead and tape the decoy over there on that arm. That looks good. All right, I'm just gonna tuck that right down by his side. Make sure he's comfy. Let's go ahead and put that IV, that decoy IV right there. There you go. And I'll get you a couple pieces of tape. Okay. So just down here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually just a little higher. There you go, perfect. I wanna make sure we put it in a comfortable place that's as unobtrusive as possible. All right. There we go, one more. Good deal. And then as I mentioned before, we're gonna make sure that the IV line is hidden behind his pillow here. That way when he wakes up, he won't see it and hopefully that'll keep him calm. Got it. And there you go. Well, you've seen just a few examples of the many difficult situations that healthcare professionals face every day. As you know, there are many more examples just like this. But whether a patient becomes agitated in the face of delirium or becomes agitated as a result of the things that seem necessary in patient care, such as IVs or Foley catheters, keep in mind the core principles. Tolerate, anticipate, don't agitate. Use these core principles to help you manage the agitated patient at a time when they need our help the most.